Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our fourth installment. And as you can see, we have improved the equipment uh, extra because it's being recorded, as you can see. And so this beamer is more powerful and hopefully it will be more visible on the video. Um, so today I thought we briefly recap what we did last time. And then um, because I had a couple of questions about the um, first project, I thought I'd walk you through that piece of code which I provided about uh, plain tic-tac-toe. In particular, uh, it's a great opportunity to have a look into powerful features of NumPy. And um, well, yeah, then also, uh, since we're talking about code today, I thought I'd show you uh, my idea of how to implement the computation of a game tree. I will then um, throw some more terms and definitions in front of you. Uh, you know, point out a brief homework and conclude with a summary. So, what did we do last time? If you remember, we basically learned about crucial concepts. It was a session of merely terms and definition, terminology that frequently reoccurs in the context of our study of game AI technologies. In particular, we uh, learned about the notion of a state space, which um, is a bit of an unfortunate choice to refer to the set of all configurations of a game. The unfortunate choice is that not every fortunate choice in that terminology is that not every configuration of a game is indeed a game state. And we have this problem that a game state is used to denote a valid configuration. And we saw a couple of examples of uh, configurations that are game states and configurations that aren't. Um, we continued looking at the notion of a game tree. And that is just a tree data structure, a graph, a directed graph, where we said that the nodes in this tree represent game states, that is valid configurations, valid configurations that indeed can occur throughout the course of a game. And the edges in this game tree represent moves. That is, if a game state is connected a node in this tree, a game state, is connected to another game state, another node in this tree, uh, that is to say that the one state is a successor of the previous state. These edges in the game tree indicate possible moves that indeed comply with the game mechanics or game rules. And the complete game tree is then that game tree whose root corresponds to the initial game state. In the case of tic-tac-toe, that would be the empty field. In the case of chess, that would be the initial uh, placement of all the pieces on the chessboard. And whose leaves in that complete game tree would correspond to every possible outcome of the game. In the case of tic-tac-toe, there are so and so many possible outcomes, say for player one to win, so and so many outcomes for player two to win, and so and so many draws. And these would be represented in the leaves of the complete game tree. You had a question. Yes, uh, isn't it better to think a uh, state of tree for a graph? Because some of the states, for example, in chess are quite the same, but you count the number of moves yeah, and yeah. You can distinguish them. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah, indeed, indeed, and I will come back to that in about two minutes. <laughs> no, no, it's an excellent question, excellent question. Um, it's a philosophical question, but we'll discuss it in a, in a minute. Here it is. <laughs> it is like, uh, I wanted to point out, and now he already did, that uh, this notion of a green game tree is indeed uh, something we could understand as a blown up partial order of game states. So what is a partial order? To understand that we have to uh, familiarize ourselves with the notion 
of a partially ordered set. Have you heard of partially ordered sets before? All right, there you go. Uh, how come you have heard of it? In what context? Like, oh, have you ever used them for some stuff you did in your studies? Yeah, okay. Which is, you know, this is very good. This is very good. Uh, mathematics and computer science, in a very broad sense, are the sciences of structures. Right? And if we understand structures, and um, we understand that problems from seemingly different domains can be reduced to the same structural representation, and we know how a problem in one domain can be solved, and now that we know that it can be reduced to the same structural representation, then the new problem we are facing, then we know how to solve that new problem. This is what university education is all about. We have to look for the underlying structures and try to map every sort of new situation we are facing to something possibly abstract uh, so that we you know, have an approach as to how to solve it. Now, a partially ordered set is a pair or a tuple uh, consisting of two elements. One is P and the other is this uh, uh, sign that indicates a relation. Uh, P is a set, some set. Uh, we don't specify that here. This relation, um, well, square less than say, is a binary relation. So this, this is something, is a, is a function that takes two arguments um, and it is defined such that for, say, three elements, A, B, C, in that set P, in this carrier set, um, it has the following properties. It is reflexive, that is to say that uh, A is always related to A, according to this relation. This, this, is, this is given. And if A is, well, let's, let's call it less than. Less than B, and B is less than A, then B and A are the same. And that is called uh, anti-symmetry. And uh, we then have this property of transitivity. That is, if A is less than B and B is less than C, then A is less than C. The crucial thing is, now you, you may have, I, I just you know, called it less than for lack of a better expression. Um, you say, yeah, well, I mean, we are well aware of the notion of the relation less than, less or equal than, um, but this square less or equal than does not necessarily have to be defined for every pair of elements in the set. And that is what distinguishes a partial order relation from an ordering relation. If this relation is defined for a pair of elements, say A and B. So if either A is less or equal than B, or B is less or equal than A, then we call these two elements comparable. If that is not the case, so it is not defined for that pair, then A and B are called incomparable. Where do these kind of relations occur? Do you have an example? The ones who are familiar with that. So the obvious example is that, well, let's look for the natural numbers, the real numbers, and the usual uh, definition of less or equal than. These are co-sets. Uh, because if a set is ordered in the sense we are familiar with, then it's also partially ordered. More interesting example would be to consider any set S, some set, and then the pair uh, of the power set, that is 2 raised to the power of S. What is the power set? That is the set of all subsets of S, right? So we look at the power set and the set inclusion relation. This is a partially ordered set. Why? Let's look at a very simple example. If we consider a set S consisting of three elements, one, two, and three, um, we know that yeah, the uh, empty set 
is definitely a subset of these elementary subsets. Uh, the subset containing just the element 1 is a subset of the subset containing element 1 and 2 and element 1 and 3, but it is not a subset of the subset containing 2 and 3. So here we see that with respect to the uh, subset relation, uh, this object here is comparable to these two, but is incomparable with that one. All right. And I have, of course, you know, omitted a couple of errors. Which which one are missing? Which ones are missing? One is comparable with the uh, one, two, three. Yeah, sure. And the uh, empty set empty is set comparable with all, with all of them. So, but then it would have gotten a bit cloudy. So yeah. But this is this is an example of um, where partially ordering relations naturally occur. You have a question? I think that the binary functions, some of them can be ordered in such a fashion. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, this, this is very universal, very universal. Here's another example. Here's another example. This is, this is from everyday life. Some kid is playing with, uh, I don't know, wooden blocks and stacking them. Right? In the bottom we have A, then B, then block C, D, E, and then some block F. And if we understand this relation to indicate below, or lower than, or whatever, or we could switch it and call it on top of, and let's, let's call it uh, below, then we you know, look at the picture and see that A is below C, and A is also below D. So A is comparable with C and D, but C and D are incomparable, according to that relation. Right, so partially ordered sets occur everywhere. Now how does that, coming back to your question, relate to the game trees? Uh, yeah, this is indeed a game tree. It looks different than last time. This is because of the graph layout algorithm I used. Um, this is some state somewhere down the line of a tic-tac-toe game totally impossible to plot the whole game tree. It's like seriously way too many nodes to you know, be visible at all. So for that reason I have to start when I'm plotting these trees somewhere down the line during the game. This is a game state where um, player X, player 1 has moved three times and player not, uh, the, the orange circle has moved three times. Now it's at um, player 1 to move again. Right? And apparently there are three empty fields left. So there's three possibilities for how the game could continue. Um, now, say if player one moves such that he places a mark on this previously empty field, like here, then for player circle, there are two possibilities left. Right? If player two chooses this possibility, game is over. So there is no subsequent game state. If player two, for whatever reason, chooses to play uh, this field, then of course the game is not over yet. And there's one more, um, one more step to take in that tree. So this looks much different than the game trees we saw last time, but it is the same. It's just a different layout. And now back to your question. What about this and this? <coughs> it's the same state. But the way of how to get there are different. All right? And in that sense, this tree is blown up. And again, note that we have started far, far down the tree. Right? If we would have started with the, with the um, initial game state, the state where all the fields are empty, and then I would have plotted the tree, there would have <laughs> numerous, numerous uh, double entries numerous repeated <coughs> entries, numerous repeated leaves in the game tree. Right. So you are right. You are right. Like why, you know, why using a tree if for some reason that leads to, uh, say in this simple example, double the effort in terms of representing certain states. And if we would have, you know, uh, shown the tree that starts much, much further up throughout the game, 
uh, we would have numerous, numerous repeated entries. We don't have to do that. We can represent it as a graph. But the trees have some nice properties, at least I think so. Yeah, yeah. This, this is exactly, I mean, um, quite literally, it does not necessarily make a difference. Difference is that if we represent um, the tree in terms of a, a different kind of graph, this, this is uh, I said still a tree because you know, this is the root node, we go down here, we go down here. Uh, this leaf now has two parents, so it's not a tree in the real sense, but it's still a directed graph. Um, if we do it like this, then of course we can dramatically save uh, in terms of uh, memory. We doesn't, do not have to represent so, so many states uh, in memory. We can you know, reuse them. Um, well, we will look into, into these three search algorithms uh, next time. And that is like the, the, the reason for representing uh, courses of possible courses of gaming in terms of trees. There are very simple algorithms that deal with trees. We'll learn about them next time. Right? But take home message is um, you always have to be careful uh, about what I'm telling you. So using trees may not necessarily be the only, less than the best way of doing it. Right? Sometimes there are situations where you have to think about different representations. You could do that. This is a partially ordered set. Okay, now um, let's dive into a NumPy today um, because I had a couple of questions. And um, I thought I'd walk you through the code I provided on the website. And to begin with, let us recall what I told you last time about how to represent game states that we have this. Uh, issue of uh, game state representation and that there are typically many different alternatives as to how to represent the game state. Um, we have to choose one that sort of fits our needs and um, for what is to come I opted for this representation. Uh, that is, uh, we will represent uh, any state in a game of tic-tac-toe in terms of 3x3 three three matrix. Right. And this 3x3 three three matrix uh, can have three different types of entries. It is either an entry in this matrix is either a 1, and whenever we have an entry of 1 in the matrix, that would indicate that the corresponding field is occupied by player cross or player 1. Um, an entry might be minus 1, that would indicate that the corresponding field is occupied by player naught or player two. And then of course, there might be empty fields, which we represent in terms of zeros. Here you have it. This is our representation of a tic-tac-toe game state. And here is the main loop for tic-tac-toe as provided in the code. Uh, first thing we do is we import NumPy, which is a Python module that uh, contains numerous uh, useful functions for doing linear algebra, statistics, and the like. We import it, and I do it as, uh, as this. I import NumPy as NP. And then, um, well, you know, we start the main loop of the program. This is basically indicated by if main equals main. So the main loop of the program begins by initializing a, a variable game state. And we use the NumPy function zeros, which uh, returns a matrix of the dimensions provided in the first argument, three and three, so it's a three by three matrix, of all zeros. That is what zeros does. Um, and I force it to be a matrix of type int. I would not have to do that, but you know, that uh, saves memory, and we don't really have to have float matrices here. Uh, we then initialize another variable called player, and we initialize it to 1, which is to say that 
probably the first move in this game will uh, be carried out by player one, which is the player using the process. And then there is a boolean variable, which I call no winner yet. And since the game hasn't even started at this point, we don't have a winner yet, so this variable is true. And then here is the main loop of the game. Basically, what this while loop does is, uh, upon entry, it checks if moves are still possible and if we do not have a winner yet. Uh, a move is still possible if there is still an empty field on the tic-tac-toe board and uh, we don't have a winner yet as long as no player has won the game. All right? And um, say both conditions are still fulfilled, well then we have to carry out whatever is inside the while loop. And uh, the first thing uh, that happens here is that the current player, which at this point in time is still player one, will move at random. All right? That will create a new game state and we will then have to check if the resulting game state is a terminal state. That is, it could be a state in which one of the two players has won the game. Uh, if that is the case, we can indicate it, print out that we have a winner, and have to set that variable no winner yet to false, which will, of course, cause that the next iteration of this while loop will not happen, because this second uh, condition is no longer fulfilled. Now, if that is, um, in any case, is the case or not, we will switch the player. Right? And um, this is, of course, a somehow very compressed way of indicating that uh, the next move is to be done by the other player. But if the current player is player one, and we multiply one by minus one, we get minus one, which indicates the other player. Right? If now player two has moved, we multiply minus one by minus one, which gives us one, which indicates next player to move is player one. So these dirty tricks are fairly usual. Right? Now, um, and, and of course, you know, this it's really very convenient. So this is basically why we would use ones and minus ones to indicate fields occupied by the different players. Say we have reached, for whatever reason, the end of the while loop. Could be that a player has won, right, that this um, variable has assigned the value of false, so that we will leave the while loop. Um, if this variable is false, well then somebody has won, and this will not be printed out. The other way of leaving the while loop is that there is no empty field anymore. Right? And in this case, no player will have won, and so we would have to print out that the game ended. So this is, this is the main loop of this tic-tac-toe game. Let's look into the ingredients. Let's look into the functions move still possible, move at random, and move was winning move. And how to implement them using NumPy. So the first one is this function move still possible, whose argument is the current game state. And here is um, how it is defined. It basically returns uh, the value of s of s equals zero dot size is greater than zero. That's it. That's it. That answers the question if a move is still possible. And that's great. See, if we use NumPy, we can do stuff like that. Why does this work? How does this work? Let's check what happens. Um, I first create an, a game state, and I call it capital S, and it is a NumPy array, um, a 3 by 3 array. I you know, did it manually here. So I define this S equals NP dot array, and then in parentheses, double brackets, whatever, three rows of a matrix. If I print out that S, this is what I get. This is, this is S. It's an array of dimension 3 by 3, and these are the entries. Now, 
if I define a variable z um, as s, and now in square brackets, s equals 0. This, this uh, you know, small piece of code actually uh, counts all the entries in matrix S, or array S, I should say, uh, that are equal to 0, and lists them in an array. So if I print out this, this innocent piece of code here creates this. So what we know from you know, calling this is that in S there should be four zeros, and indeed there are four zeros. All right. We can then look at the size of this array, and that is four. Because there are four elements in here. That's another useful NumPy feature. And of course, four is larger than zero. And that is what this function does. Right. In a very compressed form, it counts, by using this expression, it counts the number of entries of the game state matrix S that are still zero. And if this number of entries is larger than zero, then a move is still possible. If every field is occupied, there shouldn't be any field left with an entry of zero. Uh, so let's verify this. Here is another game state. Uh, this is actually a game state where player one has won. Um, why is that? Because there are ones in the Exactly. So along the diagonal, there's uh, three ones. Right? Um, obviously, this matrix does not contain a zero anymore. So what happens if we uh, compute this? It gives us an empty array. So this, this is, we have to be careful there. If we, if we use these functions, we have to sort of know what they return. They do not return the number of zeros, but they return an array with as many zeros as there, say, still are. Right? But this is an empty array because there aren't any zeros. The size of this thing, it's an empty array, the size is zero. This is what this size function does. It, you know, empties, empty arrays are of size zero. So yeah, that works. This is a game state where no move is uh, possible anymore, and uh, we would figure that out. Yeah, because uh, zero isn't larger than zero. So there we go, it's false. No move is possible anymore. Um, what about, what about if we wanted to count the number of ones instead of zeros? We could obviously do that, right? This, this function uh, s square brackets s equals zero can be applied to any number or any value for that matter. It doesn't have to be a numerical array. It can be an array of strings or whatever. Uh, but this, uh, this function would, would indeed return an array, say, with the number of ones here. What would that be in this case? Four, five, yeah, let's see. Um, there we go. Works. It really doesn't matter. Like if you want to check um, how many elements of a certain, how many entries of a certain value are in an array, you do it like this. The right. yeah, size of this is five, so we know that there's five ones in there. Um, interesting uh, further concept is the function shape. Now we have this array uh, lowercase o, and it is a one-dimensional arrays containing five entries, so its size is five. The shape gives us the dimensions of the array. And for a crazy reason, this is a tuple now. It's not just a number, but a tuple. Where the first entry contains a five, which is sort of comforting because you know it's a five-dimensional vector, the second entry is empty. Be aware of the difference between size and shape. You can use them, you know, both, but um, there are crucial differences. Crucial differences. The one counts the number of entries of an array, and the other returns the dimensions of the array. 
Now for vectors, that is typically sort of the same thing. But for matrices, what would we find if we were to apply both functions to the matrix or area, I should say, defined in the first line? Three, three, right? And number of elements? Nine. Nine. Let's see. Yes, it works. <laughs> so, given that area S up there, the size is nine because it contains nine elements. But the shape is three by three because it is a three by three area. All right. Be aware of the difference. Of course, you could compare, say, the size of an array by multiplying the two entries in the uh, return value of the shape function. But then, of course, you have to be careful if the second one is undefined because you applied the shape function to a vector rather than a matrix or a tensor. Be aware of the difference. OK, uh, here is the next function. It's the function move at random. It takes two arguments. The first argument is the current game state. The second argument is the player the variable that indicates the player who is to move. Here is what it does. First, it computes two variables, r's and c's, by using the numpy function where uh, s equals 0. Then it does some really strange i equals np dot random dot permutation of np dot a range of rs dot size and all of this of zero and then it sets s of rs of i comma c s of i to p then it turns s what does that do well let's let's look into it um here is again some game state S, right, three by three matrix, looks like this, looks like this. And now, uh, if we call the numpy function where, with the argument s equals zero, what this does, it returns the indices of the elements or entries that are zero. This is something else than returning the elements that are zero. This returns the locations of the elements that are zero. Now, and for instance, uh, this zero here is in row zero and column two. Row zero, column two. So we have a zero and a two here. This is sort of the row index of that zero, and this is the column index of that zero. Let's check for, I don't know, this one should be the one, two, three, third one. So this is in row two, one, two, three, row two, and this is in column zero. Oh yeah, it works, right? So these two variables, R's and C's, indicate rows and columns, right? And using this call, we compute the indices of all the entries in the current game state matrix that are zero. We can locate them afterwards. OK, um, yeah. In particular, if we, for the time being, ignore the column indices and just print out the uh, row indices, well, we get that array. So um, if we call this function where, again, it returns a tuple where the first entry is an array, and again, the second entry is also an array. So where returns a tuple, be aware of that. If we use it like this, if we use it like this, this is a beauty of Python, right? We know that this function where returns a tuple. So we can basically put a tuple in front of the equal sign. And then rs will be assigned the first element of the returning tuple and cs the second element. So therefore, if we just print rs, we get this array. That works beautifully. Um, and then let us define some variable ints for, say, indices uh, using the numpy function arrange. And uh, we uh, pass an argument to arrange that is the size of rs, which is basically the number of elements in rs, right? We figured that out. And so if we then print 
this new variable ints, we get an array containing numbers, well, four of them, because uh, size of rs is four, and it contains four numbers, and that is the numbers from zero to three, which is the numbers starting at zero up to four minus one. This is what npa range does, right? And then um, we can make use of functions that are contained in the random submodule of NumPy, in particular, say, the function permutation. And we do apply it to this list of numbers or area of numbers from 0 to 3. And if we call this function and print permutation, we get this. It is a permutation. It has sort of shuffled the entries in the array ints. Mm -hmm. Now, if we look at the first element, the element with zero index zero of this array, and call that one i, we get two. Right. And now we can understand why we can create a random move like that. Because if we look at the indices of the fields, the row and column indices of the fields that still contain zeros, Rs and Cs. And we then compute an array from 0 to 3, which is basically sort of you know, the pointers to the elements in Rs or Cs. And then we permute that. And after having shoveled it, we take the first element and then look at um, Rs of i and Cs of i, we get an index pair, a location in the game state matrix that is still empty. And we have now randomly picked a location in the game state matrix that is still empty and we can set it to a new value. All right. So that is, that is how that works. And now this one. Um, we have to check if once a player has moved, the game has reached a terminal state. The game is over. Uh, the move has caused the moving player to win. How would we verify that? Yeah? Uh, for the last slide, uh, I didn't understand why, why do you use comma in, uh, in the last line. Uh, why uh, the two ah. are total, you know, this is two and zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, this shouldn't be here, actually. Yeah. So. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. I created these examples sort of like out of my head on the slides, not actually in a Python shell. You are right. So there shouldn't be a um, pair of parentheses here. I can, I can, you know, I can enter that at the prompt, and it would return two and zero. But the parentheses, uh, I, I didn't see it. Yeah. You're right. They shouldn't be there, right? But you could put parentheses around here, and then uh, it would be correct. But yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was I was uh, sort of afraid something like that would happen, you know, because I'm doing the slides and I don't have to verify it in the shell, whatever. Smart enough? No, obviously not. Thank you very much. All right, uh, moving on. <laughs> we have we have this third function where we want to determine. If a move, one of these random moves, which we just saw how to realize them, has caused the game to terminate, that is, has caused the game to move to a winning state. And here is my proposal for how that can be done. Uh, this function takes, again, two arguments, uh, the game state and the variable that indicates what player was to move which is one or minus one. Let's think about it. Tic-tac-toe is played on a three by three board. A player wins if there are either three crosses or three noughts consecutive, say, and that can happen along a line, that can happen along a column, that can happen along the diagonal or the anti-diagonal. But it's a three by three board, so that's basically all the uh, possibilities we have. Uh, so I claim that we could use the function np.max and apply it to 
np dot sum of x comma x is equals zero we multiply that by p and check if that equals three if that is the case we have a winning state all right uh, we could do that where we basically replace the axis argument from zero to one uh, yeah uh, what you have written is right but it works only for player one is that so yes why because if you have minus one there, yeah. and player two is going to win, you yeah. don't have any absolute value there. So, but why so would I multiply it with p? Ah, yeah. Ah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thankful for your concern, but I guess I I was concerned yeah, yeah, myself. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. no, this indeed works. This is why I multiply it by p. Right, because if I multiply minus 3 by minus 1, I get 3, it works. Yeah, yeah. yeah this is why I do it. And then um, we could apply the same test. <laughs> we could apply the same test to the uh, function np diag of s and to the function np diag of np dot rot 90 of s. Let's look into these things. Here is uh, a situation where player cross wins. Uh, this is how it looks like. And the player has won because in the first row of that array, they're all ones. All right. Player is one, uh, they're all ones. If we compute, uh, let's, let's familiarize ourselves with the function sum. If we apply this function np sum to the array s, we get 1. Let's see, we have 1 plus 1 plus 1, minus 1 plus 1, minus 1 plus 0, minus 1 plus 0. That should be 1. So this, this is the total sum of the entries in S. Right. We can modify this function sum uh, by specifying that it should sum along the columns. Right. The, the uh, axis 0 is basically the... Uh, the axis that indicates the row indices. Right. And if we um, apply this function sum to matrix S along the columns, we don't get a single value back, but an array of size 3, because there are three columns in this area S, and every entry contains the column sum for the respective column. So in the first case, this is 1 plus minus 1 plus 0. This is indeed 0. In the second case, we have 1 plus 1 is 2, minus 1 is 1. And then the third column, again, sums to 0. So this, if we use axis equals 0, we sum along the columns of an area. If we switch axis to 1, we sum along the rows. Right? The, this is the sort of second dimension of the array. Um, it's the area dimension that indicates the column numbers. And if we set axis to 1, and we sum along the columns, then we get uh, the row sums of S. This is, again, a three-dimensional array in our case, because S is a 3 by 3 matrix. And interestingly enough, we now see that for the first row, indeed, the sum is 3, which is great, because player 1 has three consecutive one, ones in the first row. That should indicate a win. Let's multiply, or uh, let's look at the maximum here. It's indeed uh, the maximum of these three uh, row sums here is indeed three. Right? And um, yeah, I multiply it by one. Three times one is three. So it equals three and we have a winner. And here is a situation where player naught wins. This is the uh, game state. We see that the last column contains all minus ones, right? So let us compute the, um, the uh, column sums uh, and multiply it by minus one, then this is what we get. Right. First column is uh, two times minus one is minus two. Second column is the, the sum is one times minus one is minus one. And the third column sum is minus three times minus one is actually three. And so again, the maximum of this expression here is 3. And we want to check if it is 3. 
And yes, indeed, that is true. So this is a situation where the second player has won. And um, here is a situation in which no player has won yet. Let's see what happens. Let's, let's check out the function diac. Right. So if we call np diac of s, what this returns is, again, in this case, a, an array with three entries, because the diagonal of the array s contains three elements, right? This one, this one, and that one. So using this function diac actually really pulls out the diagonal out of an array. For those of you who have been with me in previous lectures and see all this fancy matrix multiplication stuff, diagonals of matrices are very, very interesting. And so therefore NumPy has a function that gets it for us. Right? Now, of course, we can sum the elements along the diagonal. In this case, that would be two. And that basically indicates that there is no winning situation along the diagonal. Right? Here is a situation where player cross wins because the empty diagonal contains all ones. So this, this is another situation how a player can win. Uh, how, would we, how would we realize that? How would we realize that this is a winning situation? Now, we may rotate the matrix by 90 degrees. And then the anti-diagonal becomes diagonal, right? Once it is the diagonal, we basically are faced with the situation we just discussed. So if I apply this rotation by 90 degree, which also comes with NumPy, this is beautiful, um, the anti-diagonal is now the diagonal. We can pull it out. It gives us three ones. We can sum all the entries in this thing. It gives us a three. We will multiply it by the player number, and, um, and we would realize that this is a winning situation. But those are the beautiful, powerful aspects of using NumPy. With like, seriously hardly any line of code, we can do very interesting things. So here's an intermediate summary of what we have learned so far. We have seen lots of useful NumPy functions. Right? And um, in particular, let's, let's go, go back. Um, there is no for loop in here. No for loop. Um, there is no for loop in there. Okay. And there is no for loop in there. And the take home message is, uh, if you do programming in Python, you have to avoid for loops as much as possible. Python is a scripting language. It's not compiled. And uh, so loops are costly. And if you, if you start using it like seriously, you will realize what I mean. You will see that your uh, code you know, may take its time to run. For our case here, tic-tac-toe game streets, three by three, made, like, this is ridiculous. This is nothing, right? Matrices with nine entries. But there are many, many other situations, not possibly in the context of games, we'll see later on, uh, where you are dealing with really large matrices. If you attack problems you have in that context, using for loops over the columns or the rows of these matrices, uh, your Python code will be very slow. And this is why NumPy comes with all these beautiful sort of hard-coded uh, functions that do very useful stuff without ever calling or using a for loop. Right. So I know this is easier said than done, but if you're using NumPy, which I highly recommend for like, you know, even simple purposes like these, uh, avoid, try to avoid for loops, try to get to think NumPythonic. Right. Basically, there shouldn't be a situation like for the level you are at, where you would ever have to use a for loop when it comes to doing something with matrices. There should be a corresponding uh, NumPy function. And yeah, well, here are some of them. And you've seen like, you know, it, it looks a bit cryptic, but very elegantly in terms of very compressed code, we can do tic-tac-toe. 
What does that have to do with Connect 4? You know that on the first project assignment you are supposed to implement Connect 4. And I said you should get inspiration from the code for tic-tac-toe. Where is the connection? Well, tic-tac-toe is played on a 3x3 board. Connect 4 on a 6x7. In tic-tac-toe, the goal is to have three things in a row in a column or along a diagonal. In connect 4, the goal is to have that for 4. So in a certain sense, you could think of a connect 4 board as a collection of lots of 4 by 4 boards. So in a sense, you have to replace every 3 here by a 4 and you get connect 4 on a 4x4 four four board and you now know how to test for termination and whatever, whatever not. Right? And then you probably have to test this at every possible location on the connect 4 board and there you are. This is indeed the same game. Same game. You can use these functions. You have to adapt them, but now you know how to. Here is a uh, an example of a tic-tac-toe game, uh, game tree. Um, and I thought I'd show you how uh, I would compute that. I don't show you how I printed it or plotted it, but let me show you how I computed it. And we have uh, learned about the joys of NumPy, so let's take the opportunity and learn about the joys of Python dictionaries. Um, let us recall that a game tree is a directed graph whose vertices are game state and where the edges are moves. Uh, what is a graph? I hope that you all know that a graph is a tuple, that is something that consists of two elements, where the first element, called V, is a set, finite set, to be precise, V1 to Vn of things we call vertices or nodes. And the second element is a relation, is a subset of the Cartesian product of E by itself. And the elements in E are called edges. All right? Now, um, if for every edge, say, pair V1, Vj, we are, we are Vj, there's also a pair in the set of edges where the order of the two elements is reversed, say this is given, or you have declared in advance that the order does not matter, so you have an element in the set of edges, say we i v j, and you for some reason know that we i v j is supposed the same as v j v i, then the graph is called undirected. If the ordering matters, the graph is called directed. For a tree, order matters, so it does make a difference if a vertex appears in the first position in this tuple or in the second. If it appears in the first position, it's called the parent. If it appears in the second, it's called the child in the context of trees. Uh, now that we know how to define graphs like mathematically, the next question is of course how to implement them on a computer. How would you do it? Do you have any ideas, any experience with implementing graphs? Pardon? Excellent choice. That is my favorite choice. Uh, you knew that, right? <laughs> any other ideas? Awesome. Awesome. Any other choice? Well, there's like numerous, numerous, numerous of them, right? Here is the idea of using matrices. Right, we can represent graphs in terms of uh, so-called adjacency matrices. So if we have n vertices, then the adjacency matrix is an n by n matrix. Uh, it's a square matrix. And let me simplify it, say that the entries of this adjacency matrix are, are either one or zero. Uh, an element aij is 1 if the element vi vj 
is in the set of edges. Uh, and if that is not the case, then AIJ is zero. So this, this is one way of representing graphs, and we will come back to this one later once we study path planning. Um, we can represent uh, the graph in terms of an edge list. Now, if you just enumerate all the uh, tuples of vertices that correspond to an edge, we have everything we need to know because all the vertices are contained as pairs of uh, elements of these tuples. And here is, um, well, yeah, in Python we call it a dictionary, but it's basically your idea of a linked list. Um, we may represent uh, the graph in terms of an adjacency dictionary that is for every vertex we would have a set or list, whatever, that contains all the vertices that are neighbors of this particular vertex. And this is the way I'm going for in what is to follow. Um, first again, I import NumPy as NP, and then from this tic-tac-toe code we just went through, I import everything in particular. Um, we need to check if the uh, node is a, is a terminal node, whatever. Right? Uh, then I am initializing two dictionaries. And in Python, these dictionaries are indicated by the curly brackets. And I am initializing them to be empty dictionaries. Right? Then we start uh, the main part of the program. And we define some game state and some player to move. So if you want to compute the complete game tree, then this S should be the empty board, and P should be player one or player two, depending on whatever. Um, but if we want to you know, plot them like this, it's impossible to start from the, from the initial state. So you choose that to your liking. Define some state as some player to move. And um, I'll then initialize a variable called node to zero. And I declare that in the node dictionary for entry zero, the corresponding value of this element zero in the dictionary should be s. This realizes a function that maps from numbers to game states. And we talked about this problem of mapping from numbers to game state last time. We saw this is always possible, uh, that there are very fairly or fairly sophisticated ways of doing it. Today we are using a much simpler way, but basically, again, this dictionary realizes a mapping from numbers to states. And these states, again, are matrices. Three by three matrices containing ones, minus ones, and zero. And then I'm calling a function called build tree, whose arguments are the current state s, and the player, and the current value of node. And here it is. At first, there is a list called suck for successors. I know it's funny. Um, so this is the list of successors of the current node. And when entering this function, we don't know how many successors there will be. So we initialize it to the empty list. All right. And we would then have to test if the state encoded in S given player P was a terminal state. Because right. if that is not the case, we know that the current node in the game tree will have successors. If it was a terminal state, it will not have successors. Then it's a terminal, it's a leaf. Right. Uh, so what if it was not a terminal state? So what if moves are still possible? Well then, we just saw how to determine the indices of the empty uh, of the fields in the state matrix that are still empty, and we do it again. This time, however, we don't randomly pick one of the empty fields, but we iterate. There's a for loop here. Uh, iterate <laughs> over all the remaining empty fields, and we create a copy of the current game state. In this copy. 
we set uh, the currently um, considered empty field to whatever p is, 1 or minus 1. And we get a new node number. And we register in our node dictionary that for this new node, the corresponding game state is this successor game state. And this node number, I determine it by just looking up uh, the maximum entry in the dictionary of nodes. And I'm adding a 1 to that, so I can be sure that this number will be uh, larger than every other node number that we have created so far. Yeah, and um, since there are still empty fields, uh, and we just have created one <coughs> successor state, we have to append that successor state, or the number of the corresponding node, the number, we don't actually append the state, to the list of successors. Well, in the first iteration of this for loop, this list will now contain one element, in the second it will contain two, whatever, how many successors there are. Okay, um, once we are done with this, uh, we will then set this list of successors in the dictionary of successors. I remember that in addition to this node dictionary, we had this second dictionary, which was initialized to an empty dictionary. Now we say for the current node, uh, we have determined the successors. That is basically to say that uh, say if that is the current node, we now have this list. Okay. That, that is what we do. I store that in a dictionary, which is very comfortable using Python. And, uh, okay, so for the current node, we have now computed all successors. But these, of course, may have successors as well. Right. That is, unless this is an empty list, which can happen. Which can happen, because it is initialized to the empty list. Maybe this test does not apply. Maybe we are already dealing with a leaf node. Then nothing will happen here. It will still be an empty list because we will not append anything to it. And so it may still be an empty list. If this is the case, there is nothing in the empty list. Nothing will happen here. However, if we have found a couple of successors to the current node, well, then we have to iterate over all these successors and call this function recursively. And that's it. That is a very simple way of how to compute a game tree using Python. There are numerous alternatives, right? And um, I'm not saying you should do it like this. Uh, you can, you know, come up with your own tree data structure and class and insert and whatever. Like, maybe you should. I don't know. Uh, but if you had no idea as to, know, as to how to do it, now you have an idea and you can at least work on the next project assignment or project two. There will be lots of stuff with game trees. Okay, and uh, before we close today, now that we know about how at least one alternative of computing game trees, we can look at more definitions and terms. Interesting stuff that will come in handy next time. The average branching factor, I should call it B, in a game tree. Uh, trees have branching factors, but let's focus on game trees. Is the average number of children of a node in a tree. Right? If the tree is, I don't know, a binary tree, then we know that every node except for the leaves has two children. There is no real average going on there. Right? But if, if the tree is somehow a more of more random structure, say as the game trees we are dealing with, some nodes may have uh, two children, some nodes may have uh, nine children, I don't know. Right? If, if the number of children per node is different, then we have to compute the average branching factor. And you actually have to compute it in the next project. These branching factors basically determine the difficulty 
that we are dealing with if we want to mm, you know, implement uh, strategies for playing tic-tac-toe, connect four, chess, whatsoever. For instance, in chess, the average branching factor has been estimated to be 35. Well, this is a good estimate, um, but seriously, we don't really know, right? because nobody has computed the complete game tree for chess yet, and it will not happen anytime soon. Uh, so it is estimated to be 35. And that is to say that in, in every game state, on average, a chess player can choose between 35 things to do for the next move. This is, is rather much. Uh, for Go, the average branching factor has been estimated to be sort of like in the ballpark of 250. Yeah. I cannot even plot the game tree for tic-tac-toe, and that is a ridiculously small one like, compared to what is out there. Uh, a tree where, on average, you have 250 children for every node is humongous. Right, this, this is uh, a very, very large game tree. For Connect4, we know. This is a difference between knowing and estimating. We know that the average branching factor is 4. Why do we know that? The game tree for Connect4 is fairly large, but it, it pales in comparison to these other tree, right? So we can compute the complete game tree for Connect4 and once we have the complete game tree we can easily compute the average branching factor which is 4. Uh, the maximum depth, let's call it M, is the depth of the deepest leaf in a tree. Right, we have the root somewhere on top of the tree, and then the next level, next level, next level, next level. There might be terminal game states on higher levels in the tree. Some player might really play stupidly, so game might terminate uh, early. But typically both players play smart, and the game goes back and forth until eventually it ends in a draw or one player necessarily wins. Uh, and the level, the deepest level on where we could find a leaf in the game tree. It's called the maximum depth. And the shallowest depth, that is what I said, like if one of the player is really playing stupidly, right, tic-tac-toe, I could win quickly if I play uh, against somebody who does really not know what they are doing. Uh, so if we have a, a terminal node, a leaf, way up somewhere in the tree, and then that's like just a few levels removed from the initial state from the root, that is called the shallower depth. Here's an example. Um, we did not start again at the initial state of tic-tac-toe. It's not possible to draw that. But there is a terminal state here. Right? Because obviously in this situation with player not to move, I mean the best choice would be to put a circle here. And then of course the game is over. And that is to say that the shallowest depth is 1 with respect to this root node. Right. Of course, player not could decide to place his or her mark somewhere else. And then the game may continue further and further until it eventually ends in a draw. Uh, and that is to say that in this example, the deepest leaf we find is at level 4. We count the uh, root node as, as level 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. So here is an example. Deepest uh, maximum depth is 4, shallow depth is 1. Can happen. Uh, and before we, we end for today, I wanted to point out that um, now we have looked into NumPy more closely today. There are numerous, literally numerous, uh, very useful libraries and modules for Python. And uh, two of which I'd like to recommend to you are Network X and maybe Pygame for those of you who are into visual bling and actually want to you know, do uh, beautiful visualizations of whatever you're doing. You might want to look into Pygame or whatever. You should definitely familiarize yourself with Network X. 
that will come in very handy for the next project assignment. Not for the current one, but for the next one, it will tremendously simplify your lives. And it is very simple and easy to use. So don't worry, but look at it. Um, here is our summary for today. What did we do? What have we learned? We looked into ways of implementing simple turn-based games. Right? So we, we, we looked into tic-tac-toe and we saw that we can really do it with just a couple of codes of Python if we make clever use of whatever NumPy has to offer. And I already pointed out that you can you know, directly extend these ideas to the problem of Connect4. So there you go. Now you know how to implement this one idea as to how to implement simple turn-based games. Um, we have met a few elementary, elementary concepts from the area of graph theory and sort of I'm sneaking them in, right? but they will be very important in a couple of lectures from now. So I'm, I'm sneaking them in, but you should be aware of what I told you about graphs. Yeah, and, and we looked into useful Python and NumPy features, and I guess that is all yeah, for today. Do you have any questions? I know that when I'm using slides, I am probably a bit too fast. And, um, but since I'm, I, I thought it is useful to have a look at all these game trees and whatever, I will be using slides for a couple of lectures to come. But once we start with the serious mathematics, I will switch to whiteboard. And then stuff will sort of slow down because then if I were to use slides and there's lots of equations, I just click through them. That is not a good idea for the time being, that is for the next couple of lectures, will we still be uh, slide based because of all the beautiful pictures we are going to, to look at. Uh, once we do serious math, I'll switch to the whiteboard. All right, with that being said, uh, we see each other again on Monday. Thank you.